Today's scripture reading is taken from Ephesians chapter 5 verse 21 to chapter 6 verse 9. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wives, submit yourself to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, his body of which he is the Savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, to make her a holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word, and to present herself to himself as a radiant church, without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. In this same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one has ever hated their own body. But they feed and care for their body, just as Christ does the church. For we are members of his body. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery, but I am talking about Christ and the church. However, each one of you also must love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. Chapter 6 Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise, so that it may go well with you and that you may enjoy long life on the earth. Fathers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. Slaves, Obey your earthly masters with respect and fear, and with sincerity of heart, just as you would obey Christ. Obey them not only to win their favor when their eye is on you, but as slaves of Christ, doing the will of God from your heart. Serve wholeheartedly, as if you were serving the Lord, not people, because you know that the Lord will reward each one of you for whatever good they do, whether they are slave or free. And masters, Treat your slaves in the same way. Do not threaten them, since you know that he who is both their master and yours is in heaven, and there is no favoritism with him. This is the word of the Lord. Let us pray. Father Almighty, we give you thanks for the reading of your word. We pray, Father, as we look to your word, your word will speak to us, your word will teach us, and your word will abide in us. We pray, Father Lord, that you will open our eyes and tune our ears to listen to your word today. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be pleasing and acceptable to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We come back to the epistle of Ephesians after having one month break. I would like to give us a short recap on what we have already looked at. The epistle of Ephesians is divided into two segments. The first segment is based on chapters 1 to 3, and the second segment is based on chapters 4 to 6. The first segment, the first half of the epistle, teaches us about all that Jesus has done for us. The Apostle Paul speaks to us about all that God has accomplished for us through our Lord Jesus Christ. So we see Paul reminding us about the story of the gospel. He will talk about how God chose us and predestined us to be adopted as God's children. He talked about how we who have placed our trust in Jesus have been sealed by the promised Holy Spirit. He talked about how through Jesus our sins are forgiven and how through Jesus we experience God's grace. He also spoke to us about how, how God desires that we as a community of God's believers would come together in unity just, a, just like how we are united with God through Jesus. So that's the first half of the epistle of Ephesians, you know, chapters 1 to 3. The second half 
which consists of chapters 4 to 6, is linked to the first half with the word therefore. So in the second half of the letter, Paul goes on to talk about how the gospel story that we see in chapters 1 to 3 should affect and shape uh, the way we live our lives in our families, in our communities, and in our church as well. So if we remember in chapter 4, Paul would call us to walk worthy of the calling that we have received. He will speak about the gift of ministry given to us by Jesus to do God's work. He then will speak about the new way of life. So if you remember, he will talk about you know, putting off the old self, which is corrupted, and then putting on a new self, which is being renewed uh, by Jesus. So today we will continue on by looking at another aspect of our lives that needs to be renewed by Jesus. So we are going to look at this whole topic of submission. We are going to see how submission will look like in our relationships. So Paul divides the relationships that we see in today's text into three categories. Marriage, families, as in parent-child relationship, and then our working relationship. So let us begin with a short illustration. You know, I, I would like to begin with this short illustration that would probably help us to understand submission. So this illustration was narrated by a person uh, called Stephen Beck. Right, Stephen Beck. I got I got this illustration uh, from online, right? So I'm going to just read his what he has written or what he has shared. So he said, Driving down a country road, I came to a very narrow bridge. In front of the bridge, a sign was posted, Yield. Seeing no oncoming cars, I continued across the bridge to my destination. On my way back, I came to the same one-lane bridge, now from the other direction. To my surprise, I saw another sign which says the exact same word, yield. And so I thought, I'm sure there was one posted on the other side. When I reached the other side of the bridge, I looked back and sure enough, the yield sign was there. The yield sign had been placed in both ends of the bridge. Drivers from both directions were requested to give way. It was a reasonable and gracious way of preventing a head-on collision. Friends, submission is having the ability to give way to the other person. The term submit is often seen often seen as a sign of weakness and therefore it is something that should be resisted at all costs. You know, that's, that's how people see it. You know, they see it as a sign of weakness and therefore we resist submission. But friends, we need not view submission in that manner. Submission is having this posture of considering the other person. And therefore, submission is both ways. That is why if we listen to the illustration story carefully, the sign yield was posted on both ends of the narrow bridge. Both drivers were requested to give, give right of way. Both drivers were, considered, were requested to consider the other person. Now, just imagine for a moment. Both drivers, one on that end and then one on this end. Both also want to go first. Both also want to have their own way. Both of them will either have a head-on collision or both of them will be just stuck at the narrow bridge. You see, many people, many people tend to look at verses 22 
23 and 24 as a stand-alone verses. These verses, verses 22 to 24, speak about wives submitting to their husbands. Well, yes, that's what the verse says. But before we look at verses 22 to 24, we need to look at verse 21. Ephesians chapter 5 verse 21 says, Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Paul calls the church in Ephesus to submit to one another and they are to do so out of reverence for Jesus. We are to submit to one, of one another because it reflects Jesus' own lifestyle. Jesus submitted himself to the cross for you and for me. Paul describes Jesus' submission to the cross in a very profound manner. If you look at Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2 verses 5 to 8. Paul would say, Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grabs, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness and being found in an appearance as a man. He humbled himself and became obedient to death even death on the cross. So you see, Jesus submitted himself to the cross for you and for me. Then we are to submit to one another because that is what Jesus teaches us to do. Jesus urged his disciples that if we are to follow him, follow Jesus, then we are to deny ourselves. Mark chapter 8 verses 34 says, If any man would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. You know, friends, to be a disciple of Jesus means that we follow him. Therefore, submission is discipleship. So we need to come away, come away from the traditional understanding of submission. We need to come away from the idea that submission is a sign of weakness. It is not, my dear friends. Submission is really about being able to consider others. Submission focuses primarily on the spirit with which we view another person. It is the inner disposition of submission to one another that Paul is urging the church in Ephesus to have. So Paul goes on to teach the church in Ephesus about how considering one another will look like in marriages, in families, and in working relationship. So a big portion of today's text focuses on the marriage relationship. Ephesians chapter 5 verses 22 all the way to verses 33. Ephesians chapter 5 verses 22 all the way to verses 33. And I have divided these verses into three parts. The first part is verses 22 to 24 and it says, Wives, Submit to your husband as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the Lord of the church, his body, of which he is the Savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. The second part is verses 25. To 30. It says, Husbands, love your wives, 
just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated his own body, but he feeds and cares for it, just as Christ does the church, for we are members of his body. The third part is verse 31 to 33, and it says, For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife. The two will the two will be one flesh. This is a profound mystery, but I'm talking about Christ and the church. However, each one of you must love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. In all of these verses, 11 verses, verses 22 and 33, we will realize that Paul stresses much on the relationship between Jesus and the church. Paul tells the church at Ephesus to build their marriage based on the relationship that Jesus has with the church. So Paul tells the wives you know, to submit to their husbands just as the church submits to Jesus. Paul tells the wives that their husbands are the head of the family, just as Christ is the head of the church. Paul tells the husbands that they ought to love their wives, not like how the movies or the novels depicts love, but husbands are to love their wives just as Christ loved the church. Now, how did Christ love the church? The text tells us that Christ gave himself up for the church. The text tells us that Christ cleansed the church in order to present the church to himself as a radiant church. The text also tells us that Christ feeds and cares for the church. So my dear brothers who are husbands, you are to love your wives like that, like Christ. So, so friends, although we see that Paul did not use the word submit literally uh, for the husbands, but we do see, we do see a mutual submission happening in a marriage context. We do see a mutual considering of one another happening in Rich. You see, husbands loving their wives and wives respecting their husbands. That is how the relationship between Jesus and the church is. Jesus loving the church and the church respecting Jesus or rather having a reverence for Jesus. So friends, this is important. We need to build our marriages on the solid foundation of Christ. We cannot build our marriages on what people would think or what people would say. We cannot build our marriages on what our cultures might tell us. We must build our marriages on what Jesus has done for the church. We need to imitate Christ. And for that to begin happening in our marriages, we need to have Christ at the center of our marriage. We need to learn to pray together as husbands and wives. We need to learn to study the word together as husbands and wives. We need to learn to do devotions together as a couple. And surely, 
the grace of God will be with you as you build your churches. Moving on, Paul speaks on the context of a parent-child relationship. Let us look at Ephesians chapter 6, verses 1 to 4. Paul says, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honour your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise, that it may go well with you and you may enjoy long life on earth. Fathers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. Here, Paul addresses the children. He speaks directly to the children. This means that these children are not babies. They are, in a sense, old enough to understand. They are actually present in the community when they come together in worship or when they come together to listen to the reading of God's word and to receive teaching at that time. Huh? At that time. They are present. So Paul addresses them directly, saying to them, Children, children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honour your father and mother, which is the first commandment that it may go well with you. You know, many a times, children find it difficult to obey. Children are very quick to say no and don't want I know because I have a four-year-old nephew who uses these two words very often, in fact, all the time. I will tell him, son, can you pick up your toys? No. Son, can you finish your rice? No. Now, these are just examples. So Paul motivates the children to obey their parents. He tells them to obey their parents in the Lord. It is pleasing to God for children to obey their parents. He tells them that obeying their parents is the right thing to do. Parents need, need to learn to set healthy boundaries for children. Set healthy boundaries for children and parents need to help the children, help their children not to cross it, to learn not to cross it. You know, my dear friends, this is a God-given responsibility to parents. Parents are to set boundaries for their children and children are expected to obey them. And parents need to help them in the process. That is what Paul says in verse 4, you know, Ephesians chapter 6. Verse 4, fathers do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. The word exasperate means to provoke. So, so you cannot, don't do that. Don't provoke your children. What this means is that parents need to learn to be sensitive to their children. You know, you relate to them. In the way you relate to them, you need to be sensitive. Relate to them well. Have conversations instead of mere instructions. So when they are really, really little children, yes, we give them instructions. You know, pick up your toys, finish your food, clean your room. It's, it's really about instructions. But as they grow, we need to learn to have conversations with them. You see, when we have conversations with our children, we are able to have, to build a good relationship. So I, I once saw this video on Facebook. It's a video on Facebook. And the video was about a young teenage girl. A young teenage girl. So probably young, lah, huh? young teenage girl who wasn't invited to a particular party. This young teenage girl was feeling quite upset that she was not included in. You know, and she was not included into the party. So her father was trying to find out 
why she was being so upset. And after asking her some questions, you know, trying to have a conversation with her, the father realized or the father learned that his daughter was not invited to the party because her friends knew. Her friends knew that it is, a, it is the kind of party that her father would not approve of it. So the father felt very quite bad in his heart, you know. He felt that, you know, his daughter was left out because of the rules and boundaries that he had set for her. And so the father then asked the daughter, the, the, the young teenage daughter, he said, well, should we then revisit the rules? Should we then revisit the rules? The daughter paused for a moment. And then the daughter replied, No, we should keep the rules because those are good rules. No, we should keep the rules because those are good rules. Friends, having conversations with our children instead of mere instruction you know, as they grow up is one of the many ways that will help, will help and motivate our children towards <clears throat> obedience and honor. Lastly, Paul speaks on the context of a working relationship. Ephesians chapter 6, verses 5 to 9. Paul says, Slaves, obey your earthly masters with respect and fear and with sincerity of heart, just as you would obey Christ. Obey them not only to win their favour when their eyes is on you, but like, but like slaves of Christ, doing the will of God from your heart. Serve wholeheartedly as if you were serving the Lord, not men, because you know that the Lord will reward everyone for whatever good he does whether he is a slave or free. And masters, treat your slaves in the same way. Do not threaten them, since you know that he who is both their master and yours is in heaven, and there is no favoritism with him. Now, slavery does not really apply to our current context now. In many countries, the slavery system has been abolished. But we should not skip this portion of scripture because we can learn so much about the kind of attitude that one should have at work. At work. Employer-employee relationship. And allow me to briefly share with us two lessons that we can learn from this portion uh, of scripture. Firstly, we need to learn to do our work with pure heart and a good intention, good attitude. We should not perform just to make a good impression. Paul says that we are to obey our superiors with respect and fear and with sincerity heart. You know, when our bosses are not watching, when our bosses are not in office, do we still give our 100% respect, fear, and with sincerity of heart? Secondly, we need to consider our work as an act of worship unto God. If we look at verses 7 and 8, Paul urges the church in Ephesus to serve wholeheartedly as if you were serving the Lord, not men. Because you know that the Lord will reward everyone for whatever good he does, whether he is a slave or free. Serve wholeheartedly as if you were serving the Lord, not men. Friends, we need to consider our work 
as an act of worship unto God. You know, friends, when we do that, when we consider our work as an act of worship, you know, when we work wholeheartedly as if we are serving God, when we are committed to the job, we become witnesses for Jesus in our workplace. We automatically become witnesses for Jesus. When we approach our work with such an attitude, we bring comfort and ease to our colleagues. We are able to build better relationships with our co-workers and we will be able to create opportunities you know, whereby we can share the gospel message to our colleagues. You know, when our co-workers are at ease with us, they will open up and share their lives, their struggles with us. And we would then have the opportunity to be witness. So friends, submission with one another is really about considering the other person is valuing the other person in our lives. Submission is discipleship and it can be practiced in our marriages, in our parent, in a parent-child relationship, and as well as in our working relationship. Let us pray. Father Almighty, we thank you for your word. Thank you for reminding us for all that Christ has done for us, for the church. Thank you for reminding us how Jesus loved us, loved the church. And therefore, Father, help us to build all our relationships, be it in our marriages, in our families, our parent-child relationship, and also in our working relationship, help us to base all these relationships on the foundation of Jesus Christ. Help us to imitate Christ in how we relate to one another. And give us, Father Lord, the grace that we need in order for us to consider one another in our lives. So we thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen.